feet. In boldness and confidence, we approach the throne. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have promised us that if we turn anxiety and worry into petition and request with thanksgiving, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard, stand sentry around our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Help us to focus upon those things which are excellent and praiseworthy. Help us to focus on what your Holy Spirit is going to say to us this evening. God, we thank you so much for this special time. I thank you for each person who has made this time a priority. And we ask that you will speak to us. We say, along with servants from all ages, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 613. 613. Is that number significant to anybody? 613. What makes that number stand out? Anybody? 613 commandments. 613 commandments under the Old Covenant, the Law of Moses. Out of all the laws of God proclaimed to Israel through Moses, and that's what you get. 613. 248 do's and 365 don'ts. So there's a negative commandment for every single day of the year that you can memorize. 248 positive prescriptions, 365 negative proscriptions. The positive commandments range from topics like worship, the temple, the priesthood, sacrifices to Sabbaths and special days, festivals, purity, the treatment of slaves, and so on and so forth. The negative commandments run the gamut from worship of false gods to alliances with enemy nations to blasphemy to diet to agriculture to business and worship practices in the Lord's sanctuary. 613 commandments, 248 do's, and 365 don'ts. Now, that's a lot to keep straight, right? It could be a little overwhelming. could be a little confusing. Now, if you go into Jesus' day with the scribes and the Pharisees and their desire to put a hedge about the law, uh, they multiplied that list uh, many-fold in order to make sure that you didn't even come close to breaking one of those do's or don'ts. And so they tied up a burden of law and rules and regulations that they laid upon the people, a burden too heavy for them to carry. And Jesus chastised them, called them out for doing that, for putting this load upon the people and not even lifting a finger to help them. And no wonder Jesus says, Come unto me, all you who are weary, and heavy laden. He's talking to people who are weary and heavy laden by rules and regulations. He says, I will give you rest. Take your yoke upon me. Attach myself to me. Become my disciple. And you will find rest for your souls. 613 commandments. Pretty complicated. Now wouldn't it be nice if Jesus had taken all of those commandments and boiled them down to the most important. You know, maybe if he had said... Here's the two. This is what it all comes down to. Two commandments. Like, kind of like a greatest commandment and a second greatest commandment. Wouldn't that have been nice if Jesus had done that for us? Yes, he did, didn't he? He did. One time a lawyer came to him and said, of all the commandments, which one is the most important? That was the thing that religious lawyers like to discuss then. And people like to discuss those kind of things now, don't they? Like, how many angels can dance on the head of a needle? Uh, I don't know. Uh, today I was asking somebody, do you think Adam and Eve had a belly button? Interesting question, right? Anyway, we ask questions like that sometimes maybe to divert from the truths that God wants to get through to us. And so the lawyer says, of oh, well, all the commandments, which one is the most important? And what does Jesus say to him? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He says the most important commandment is this. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So it all comes down to love. Loving God and loving people. L-O-V-E. Living our values every day. That's what we're talking right now in this five-part series 
about vertical values and horizontal values, going all in with God, making His will, His ways, our number one priority, seeking to live by His values, loving God, loving people. These values for our church and for each one of us as Christians being both our highest aspirations and our deepest ideals. So we have vertical values that relate to the love of God. These include the priority of prayer, which we discussed last week. The worship of God, which we are discussing tonight. And the word of God, vertical values related to our love for God and the greatest commandment. And then there's horizontal values related to those around us. The fellowship of believers, sharing life together. We'll get a little taste of that tonight as we talk about what worship services were like in the New Testament church. Also, the world around us, reaching out to the people uh, around us and you know, not just saying, well, God saved me from sin, so I'm, I guess I'm okay, but realizing, hey, there's other people that we need to share the good news with, just like someone shared the good news of Jesus Christ with us. And so these are our horizontal values related to loving neighbor as we love ourselves. Let's talk about the worship of God, the worship of God. Authentic worship is God-honoring Christ-centered and Spirit-directed. It's God-honoring, it's centered in Christ, it's directed, it's empowered by the Holy Spirit. The Lord inhabits the praises of His people. Now, worship is the purpose of all things. It's the goal of daily life. I mean, that's why we exist. We were planned for God's pleasure. We were created to worship Him. Why do we exist? To worship God, to glorify Him, and to enjoy Him forever. That's why we exist. It's also the central event of our weekly church gatherings. It's the chief expression of our corporate unity as an assembly of believers, our worship services. In our worship services, we ought to, just a little bit, taste a little bit of heaven on earth, if you will, because we'll be spending eternity singing the praises of God, our Creator, our Redeemer, our Lord. So today we consider the who, what, where, when, and why of worship. So let's get right down to it. First of all, who? Who is our worship to be focused upon? How would you answer that? This is an easy one, Sunday school question. Who? Jesus? God? All right. They're all right answers. Only the one true God is worthy of our worship. Only the one true God is worthy of our worship. God is a jealous God. The very first of all the Ten Commandments given at Mount Sinai, after reminding the people that it was the Lord who redeemed them from slavery in Egypt, the very first commandment is, you shall have, what? No other gods before me. God is a jealous God. He will not share his glory, will not share his praise with another. No other gods before me. Christian worship, particularly, is centered in the adoration and praise of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Worship is centered in, focused on, all about the one true God who was, who is, who is to come, the triune God who created the universe, who redeemed Israel from slavery in Egypt, who saved us from our sins, redeemed us from slavery to sin and death and the law by the death of Jesus Christ upon the cross, a once and for all final sacrifice for sin. This is the God that we serve and worship. Sadly, worship services and church gatherings today, in many cases, are often more about the worshiper than the God being worshipped. A lot of times our services and our gatherings are more about the people in the pews than the God to whom we are directing our praise. Think about it for just a moment. How do we evaluate a church service when you drive home afterwards? Maybe you're thinking about it, maybe you're discussing it with a family member or a friend. What do you say? Well, did, did I like the singing? Uh, did I find the sermon interesting? Did the pastor tell jokes that made me laugh? Did the pastor weave a tale that brought tears to my eyes? 
Was I moved by the prayers? And so on and so forth. I, I, me, me. It's all about me. What did I think about it? How did it make me feel? Was I inspired? Was, did I have some kind of mushy-gushy, heartwarming kinds of feelings? Nothing wrong with emotional response. And certainly, man, sometimes when you gather with God's people and you start lifting high the name of Jesus, you can just get lost in the moment. And maybe you've had times where you just had tears streaming down your face. Or maybe you just really sense the joy of the Lord flooding your soul. I mean, there's nothing like gathering for worship with God's people. <coughs> Well, the fact of the matter is, in the American church, in many cases, worship has become all about the people in the pews, not the God in the heavens. Worship has become all about me, my wants, my ways, my wishes. So I want you guys to repeat after me, okay? It's not about me. Say it. It's not about me. Now look at the person next to you, if there's somebody next to you, and say, it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not about you. Who's it about? God. The one true God, the creator, the redeemer. That's who it's about. A little boy was going to bed one Sunday after attending church with his parents earlier that morning. And as he's kneeling beside his bed, he's saying his prayers. He says, dear God, we had a great time in church today, but I sure wish you could have been there. <laughs> Is that what our church gatherings have become? Many years ago, a famous pastor in Brooklyn asked his brother, his brother was a less noteworthy minister, to fill the pulpit in his absence. This was one of those famous ministers who people traveled from all over, curiosity seekers, looky loos to get a glimpse of the service and see what it was all about. And specifically, they wanted to hear from this noteworthy minister. So a time comes for the sermon and up stands this lesser known brother. And when he says the prayer and begins to preach, some very brazen folks stand up from their seats and begin to walk towards the back door. They didn't come to hear from this guy. They came to hear from the famous preacher. And so the man in the pulpit stopped his sermon, cleared his throat, and he said, All those who came here this morning to worship my famous brother may withdraw from the church. Those who came to worship God may remain. What do we come to church for? To worship God. To worship God. It's not about the person in the pulpit. It's not about the music and how it makes me feel. All those things are important, but we come to worship God. It's not about you. It's all about Him. It's all about the one true God. So Jesus boiled it all down to two. At Sinai, the Lord distills it to ten. The two tablets, the very first one, you shall have no other gods before me. And it's ego, it's me with a capital M, the great I, that becomes the center of my universe so often. And God says it's not about you. And the cool thing is, when it's not about you, you are blessed. When you realize it's all about God, you begin to become satisfied in him. And when God is most glorified by you, you are most satisfied in him, and you're at peace. No matter what circumstances may come upon your life, you'll have the joy of the Lord. It will be your strength. You'll persevere. You'll stand strong. You see, God is not somebody who's content to play second fiddle in your life or in your worship. He's not content to ride in the back seat. He won't accept second place in your heart. So we've got to come back to the heart of worship. It's all about him. It's not about us and what we've made it. That's the who of worship. How about the what of worship? Worship, a kind of formal definition, if you will, is ascribing to God the worth of which he and he alone is worthy. Ascribing to God the worth of which he and he alone is worthy. Our English word worship comes from the root word worthy. Worthship. Shortened it to worship. Psalm 18.3, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Revelation 4.11, the throne room in heaven. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. By your will they existed and have their being. You are creator. You are sustainer of all things. In Revelation chapter 5, who will be found worthy to open the seals and to enact the Father's 
plan for the end of all things. Worthy, we read, is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. God is worthy. Worship is ascribing to him the worth of which he and he alone is worthy. Joseph Stoll says, quote, Worship is the ongoing declaration of the worth of God in my life. Worshiping God and loving God are really kind of the same idea. If we are to worship God wholeheartedly, he will be our number one priority. He will be the most important person, the most important thing in our lives, his will, his ways, his work become our focus. To worship the Lord our God is to love him with the totality of who we are, heart, soul, mind, and strength. To love those created in his image, to love neighbor as self. And so we must never lose our first love. God must be first in our affections, first in our thinking, first in all of our motivations, our work, our endeavors. So what does worship look like in the church, in the local church? I mean, that's the formal definition. Worship ascribing to God the worth of which he and he alone is worthy. By the way, worldliness can be defined as finding your worth in the stuff of this world. Worship is finding your worth in God and his glory. That's what it's all about. But what does worship, specifically the worship service, look like within the life of the local church? We must be careful, first of all, to distinguish between style and substance. The substance of worship is this definition we're talking about. It's all about giving God the glory. Worshiping Him, ascribing to Him worth, not just with our praises and our songs, but with our lifestyles as well. A style speaks of maybe cultural expression, personal preferences. We all have personal preferences and expressions. Some people like uh, small church services with a few people gathered rather informally. Some people like you know thousands of people all gathered where you got the countdown before the service and everything starts exactly on time. You know, some of our services, uh, they start when people get here. <laughs> and that's kind of how things go. So everything is a little bit different. It's a cultural expression. It's an expression of the people gathered together. It's a stylistic thing. Substance defines what worship is all about, however. Ascribing ultimate worth to God. Certain styles of worship may be outside of your comfort zone, but that does not make them wrong or incorrect. could just be something different. So we must... Distinguish between personal preference and biblical precept. So I remember in the 90s, when I was a young man, what was going on, 80s and 90s, what some people have termed the worship wars. You know, and so you had people that thought the only instrument should be a, a piano and maybe an organ, and the only songs you should sing should be hymns, and others who said, no, we want choruses, and we want a live worship band, and we want drums, and we want songs that we can really get into, and you know, raise our hands to, maybe sway a little bit, maybe dance in the aisle, you know, so you're saying, well, okay, now you're going a little bit too far. So it depends on style, cultural expression. People that have traveled to other parts of the world, of course, maybe a little more open to that because they see, okay, these people are praising Jesus, they're worshiping God, it just looks a little bit different than what I'm used to. And you start to open your mind to some of those stylistic things a little bit. But we need to distinguish between personal preference and biblical Precept. Now, not all differences in church worship are stylistic. Some are substantive. And some get the substance of worship right, but some get the substance of worship wrong. It begins with us personally and how we view God and why we have come to worship. And also it relates to the church as well. Are they staying true to the Word? Are they staying true to the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the doctrines of God? So clearly proclaimed in Scripture, the teachings of God, so clearly proclaimed in the scriptures. Are they staying true to that? Some churches emphasize pomp and ceremony. You might think sometimes that you're at a coronation service for a king. It's just pomp and ceremony and those kinds of things. Others emphasize ritual and sacrament. And maybe some of the things that are happening are communicating to worshipers that through these religious activities, grace is being given to them. Maybe even given them through the priest or the person who is up in the front administering the rites. Others emphasize preaching and the word. and Maybe less of an emphasis upon music or congregational involvement. And a lot of it is people uh, sitting and watching and maybe singing, but mostly 
just, you know, taking notes. Maybe not a lot of personal involvement. Other churches might focus on more revivalistic sorts of things, emotional appeals, uh, crisis conversions, long altar calls, and that kind of thing. You might wonder, what did worship look like in the New Testament? You ever ask that? Well, let's, let's look at a few verses that describe worship in the New Testament. Uh, first of all, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. This is right after Pentecost. 3,000 people have just been baptized and have joined the church in Jerusalem. Upon hearing the powerful preaching of Peter, say that ten times real fast, the powerful <laughs> preaching of Peter on Pentecost, 3,000 are added to their number. And then we come to chapter 2 of Acts, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves. This is what they are all about. So the apostles' teaching. And we have that today in the New Testament. The apostles' teaching, the accurate, Holy Spirit-inspired record of the teachings and the life of Jesus and the apostles' explanations under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Teaching, the fellowship, fellowship is koinonia, it's sharing life together. And we'll see that in the New Testament church, there were no needy persons among them. Everyone shared what they had with everyone else. And so there was a generosity, there was a sharing of life. The breaking of bread, a reference to uh, the Lord's Supper, definitely a reference to that. Here at Montrose, we celebrate it the first Sunday of the month. They probably celebrated it more often than that, at least once a week, probably a lot of times when they really got together. And also agape feasts or fellowship meal. So here at our church, when we have communion, we always have a fellowship meal. In the morning service, it follows communion. In the evening service, it precedes communion. But it's important to have that breaking of the bread Together, sharing meals around the table, table fellowship, such an important symbol of our communion in Christ. And then prayer, prayer being a high priority to the early church as it should be to us today as well. So that's a little bit of a, a pulling back of the curtain so that we can see something of what worship was like in the early church. Let's pull the curtain back a little more in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Paul encourages the Ephesians to be filled with the Spirit. And then he says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks Always and for everything to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so we see here that psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing, an important part of New Testament worship. And that came, of course, from typical synagogue worship in the first century, incorporated right into the worship of God's people centered in the triune God. Making melody to the Lord with your heart. You flip over again to Colossians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Uh, starting at verse 15. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Elsewhere we have a little bit more detail when Paul writes to young Timothy. He says, you know, do not neglect the public reading of scripture, the public reading of the word. So we have an emphasis here on uh, two Things that seem to be primary in this simple worship of the local church. And that is the word and worship in song. Worship as we study the word and worship as we sing and lift our voices in praise. Boil it all down. These are core elements. Of course, we would add into that the Lord's Supper and fellowship. And all that involves our times together as brothers and sisters 
in Christ. Uh, one more reference that we should turn to, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14 in our Bibles. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, uh, rather, 1 Corinthians 11, talking about Lord's Supper and things. 1 Corinthians 12, talking about spiritual gifts. For chapter 13, talking about love. And then in chapter 14, coming to more discussion about tongue speaking and interpretation in the church. We don't have time to get into a discussion about sign gifts and speaking in tongues and that kind of thing tonight. But Paul does emphasize in verse 26 and following the order that should be in any church service. So verse 26, what then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Now these words here are not prescriptive, they're descriptive. He's describing what the gatherings of the church in Corinth are like. A hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, an interpretation, people of spiritual gifts, using them to edify, to build up the body. Verse 33, uh, the end of verse 26 says, let all things be done for building up. Let all things be done for building up. Almost like a temple imagery that we are all part of the spiritual temple being built <coughs> to the honor and glory of the Lord, building up the body of Christ. Verse 33 says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And then verse 40, All things should be done decently and in order. You can read more to fill in some of the specific blanks that Paul is talking about to Corinth, but those are the main principles. All things should be done for building up, and all things should be done decently and in order. He also says that if a non-believer happens to come to your church... He, ought, he or she ought to fall under the conviction of God because he or she realizes that God is in this place. Not like a little boy who goes home and prayed, God, I wish you had been there today. <laughs> but people ought to recognize, wow, God is not in this place. This, this room is not anything special. All right, just bricks and mortar and nice room. It's the people that gather here that are the temple of the Holy Spirit together and as individuals are temples of the Holy Spirit. So all things should be done decently and in order. That doesn't mean that we don't leave room for the Holy Spirit. There ought to be room for the Holy Spirit to enter into our services. Maybe things go a little bit different than what was planned. There ought to be space for that kind of flexibility. So at its core, worship and word and deed is declaring that God is worthy, that God is number one. All right, let's move a little bit quicker now. Uh, where? Where? I wish we had more time to go into this because I think it's pretty instructive. I think we mess up when it comes to the where of worship because we've fallen into this cultural understanding of religion as a certain place that we go to worship and a certain time that we worship. And that's not at all what it is. Okay, place and custom versus spirit and truth. In the book of Acts, a really interesting episode takes place with Stephen. He was just chosen to be a deacon, but he's also full of grace and power, does signs and wonders among the people. He's arguing for Jesus Christ from the scriptures, showing that he is the Messiah. The religious leaders are threatened by him, Acts 6, verse 13. They set up false witnesses, and the false witnesses say against him, This man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law, speaking about the temple and the Mosaic law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Now look at what they're focused on. This is what religious people everywhere are focused upon. Place and custom. A special place that you go and certain customs that you do rituals and that kind of thing. Now look at what Stephen says in response to that. He's going to build an argument using the entire history of God's people in the Old Testament, how they had rejected the prophets and ultimately finally they rejected the Messiah. He reminds them in verse chapter 7, verse 47, of Solomon building the glorious temple in Jerusalem. He says, it was Solomon who built a house for him, Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. 
As the prophet says, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? What is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So we sometimes call the church the house of God. And I understand what we're saying when we say that. But really, this building is a place where Christians gather. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Together, we are a temple of the Holy Spirit. But this building is a building. It's a meeting place where believers gather in this assembly called the local church. Jesus, and probably the greatest principal statement about worship in the entire New Testament, Jesus, in John chapter 4 and verse 16, speaking to the woman at the well, John chapter 4, verse 16, he says, Go and call your husband. The woman says, I have no husband. Jesus says, you're right in saying I have no husband. In fact, you've had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman says to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then like people often do, she tries to change the subject, right? Uh, she says, uh, what do you think? Uh, should we worship in Jerusalem like you Jewish people say that we should? Or should we worship here in Mount Gerizim like the Samaritans have always said? You know, religious dilemma. Let's, let's get this off of focusing on me and my problems. Let's talk about some big religious conflict or dispute. You ever know somebody to do that when you bring up something kind of personal and they're like, oh, well, I, if God is good, then why does he allow pain and suffering? And it's like, well, wait just a minute. Let's come back to what we were talking about. People always want to go off on diversions and things like that. Jesus said to her, cuts to the crud, he says, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming. This is verse 21 of John 4. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain, Mount Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem, will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews, from the Messiah, Jewish Messiah, fulfillment of God's prophecies. But the hour is coming, and it's now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him will worship him in Spirit and in truth. And spirit reminds us that God is not limited to a physical body. That God is everywhere present. And so Jesus takes special place off the table. And says God is spirit. Everywhere is holy. Take off your sandals for you are on holy ground. Applies as much at my home as it does here in front of the pulpit. Holy ground. God is everywhere present. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere I go, in that sense, is holy ground. There's no separation between work and play and worship. We like to separate and compartmentalize our lives. It doesn't work that way. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. There's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus. And so, worshipers that will worship in spirit... And in truth, in John chapter 3, Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus goes more into the idea of what it means to be born of the Spirit. So place and custom versus spirit and truth. Spirit and truth is the New Testament emphasis. Place and custom is the Old Covenant emphasis, and that's religion. Place and custom, religion, spirit and truth, relationship. We can also look at the difference between the tabernacle of the wilderness, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't have time to get too deep into that. But the tabernacle is all about separation. Yes, it represented God's presence amongst his people, but it also reminded them that they were sinful and he was holy. And so you have the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is, and the mercy seat, and there the presence of God resides. But it's separated from the people by a veil, a curtain. And only one time a year, and only one person, the high priest, could enter into the Holy of Holies. And then outside of that, the holy place, outside of that, the uh, first courtyard, if you will, of the, temp of the tabernacle, and then outside of that, where the people were. God dwelled amongst his people, but he is holy, they're sinful, therefore separation. What happens when Jesus dies upon the cross to the curtain in the temple? It's torn in two. It's torn in two. Because Jesus grants direct access to God the Father. In boldness and confidence, 
we can go before the Father's throne of grace to seek grace and mercy to help us in our times of need. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit together, says 1 Corinthians. Do you not know that you yourselves are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. The win of worship, again, worship is not a service we go to, nor does a time and date on our calendar. It doesn't begin at 10.45 and then at 12.15. It doesn't begin at 7.30 p.m. and end at 8.30 p.m., or maybe a little bit later sometimes. <laughs> it's a 24-7, 365-day experience. Religion says, oh, I live my life how I want, but I get me a little religion on Sundays. Relationship, uh -uh. this is a 24-7, 365-day-a-year kind of deal. And when I'm at work, I'm worshiping. When I'm at play, I'm worshiping. When I'm relaxing with the family, I'm worshiping. When I'm gathered together with the believers in the church, I'm worshiping. There's no separation. All of life is lived before God on holy ground, and all of life should be worship, an everyday opportunity to lift high the name of Jesus Christ. And the why of worship, we worship the one true God because of who he is and because of what he has done. Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and power, for you created all things. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. We worship the one true God, in light of his attributes, the attributes of God, who he is, and the acts of God, what he has done. Who he is and what he has done. Who he is. We should spend time contemplating, thinking upon the excellent and praiseworthy reality of who God is. He is omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent, meaning that he is all-powerful, he is all-knowing, he is everywhere present. He is loving and kind and gracious and merciful, and yet he is righteous and he is wrathful in his response to sin. This is who God is. He is just and he is good. He is unchanging. He is patient. He is jealous of our affection. And he is holy, completely righteous. The attributes of God. Spend some time adoring his attributes. Make that part of your time with God. Not just giving him thanks, as important as that is, but adoring him for who he is. And the acts of God, what he has done. In scripture, two primary acts. Creation. He created us. He made us in his image. We belong to him. He owns us. We are accountable to him. And redemption. The great act of redemption in the Old Testament was the delivery of Israel from slavery in Egypt. The great act of redemption, the final work of Christ upon the cross, reminds us Jesus, our Redeemer. We look back upon that, we give thanks for that, along with giving thanks to the God from whom all blessings flow. Adoring Him for who He is, thanking Him for what He has done. You see, you and I, we were made to worship. We were planned for God's pleasure. Our reason for existence, why we are walking on this planet, is to glorify God. And for those of us who have been redeemed from our sins by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, why are we not transported directly to paradise at that moment? Because we have a job to do. To declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his glorious light. Probably the greatest act of worship is to invite others to join you. To multiply the worship that you enjoy and that God has called you to. So worship isn't about me. Worship isn't about you. It's about the one true God. Father, Son, Son. And Holy Spirit. May our worship be God honoring, Christ centered, and Spirit directed. Let's pray together.
Gracious Father, we want to lift high your name. We who bear the name of Jesus Christ, may we never bring it into ill repute. May we never live in such a way to smear his name before the world, but may we magnify his name. May we magnify you. May the work of your spirit be magnified in us, not because it needs magnification, God, but because you are so great. And may you be magnified in our understanding, in our heart, in our mind. Be magnified in our souls, in our strength, in our work, our endeavors. Lord, be magnified that we might ascribe to you the worth of which you and you alone are worthy. That we, who have been set apart for your glory, who have been redeemed for your purpose, that we might declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his glorious light. This we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said together, Amen. 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 Amen.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you.